Yes, Trevor, if you don't mind, I'd like to call the Board of Health, uh, Board of Selectmen Board of Health meeting to order at five o'clock. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Trevor to read the um, remote business. Okay. So uh, welcome to the Board of Health meeting, uh, December 4th, 2020 at 5 p.m. Um, we normally hold meetings in the main meeting room in the municipal offices at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, but meetings uh, normally held at the offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20. Meetings are typically broadcast on frontier community access television remote meeting connections, uh, connection noted uh, below. So you can dial in 312-626-6799. Um, and then the meeting ID is 620-007-8930. Passcode is 627-371. These are all things um, found on our agenda that are posted on the Deerfield um, Town Hall web, town website. So you can just pull up the Board of Health meeting for tonight. All that information is there along with a hyperlink to this Zoom meeting. And um, so we'll have a, um, we call the meeting to order. We have scheduled um, appearances in this meeting, and um, we're here to discuss uh, Select Board Board of Health hereby calls an emergency meeting to consider um, a confirmation of the case numbers for school uh, opening on December 7th. So our meeting's called to order and I'll allow other towns to do the same. Thank you, Carl. Would you mind? Um, do you have Do you have someone else? Oh, I think I saw. I can't see who's here. Um, but do you have um, a quorum? Oh, uh, you're you're still muted. Carl, Carl. you have to meet, unmute to call your meeting to order. <laughs> there we go. There you okay. are. Okay. Thank no, you, we Carl. Don't, we do not have a quorum. The, okay. Um, you know, it's just me and Veronique are here. Um, All right. Well, that's vote, okay. You can take a vote at a later date if you choose to do something different. Yep. We have voted it right now to open the schools. So um, this is a discussion. Um, it's a, cons a consultation with the four boards of health or the four towns boards of health um, to see if the conditions exist that would alter our earlier decision to open the school on December 7th. So maybe actually you don't need to even have a reconsideration if, if you feel like everything is okay. Um, Caitlin, do you have a quorum? Um, I see Bruce Bennett. Um, I don't know if Ken Kushai is on. We do have a quorum. I, I am on. Okay, oh, so we have all three of our Board of Health members. Great. Oh, perfect. Um, do you want to open the meeting, you know, call your meeting to order? Uh, I would call uh, the Sunderland Board of Health meeting to order and would refer to the uh, COVID-19 um, guidelines as far as this being a remote meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't tell if uh, Fran Fortino is on or anybody from Waitley. Oh, Fran, there you are, great. Do you wanna call your meeting to order? Yes, Bruce too. Fran, do you wanna call your meeting to order? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't see any other members here though. Okay, well, we'll just similar to um, Conway, um, you might want yes. to call a further meeting um, to make a difference. Oh, we have one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Becky. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, then go ahead. Welcome. Welcome. I call it to order. Right. The Waitley Board of Health. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fran. Um, well, what I wanted to do is just um, there is concern because our, our I just want to reiterate our goal again is to keep community spread in check keep our communities safe and our schools open. And that has been the bottom line. Um, the schools have been doing an excellent job of mitigation with mask wearing. The compliance has been very good. 
uh, there's been uh, social distancing and good hygiene practices at the schools. We do have community spread that is has increased. We were aware of that. Yes, Trevor. Um, Jen Jennifer was just going to help with some guidance on the meeting real quick. Oh, OK. Yes, okay. Jennifer, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so if anybody's calling in, you can mute your phones by doing star six, and that will mute you and unmute you. And if you want to raise your hand, you do star nine. Um, otherwise, people that are calling in, please do um, the raise your hand feature if you want to speak, and then I can call on you as, um, as it's listed on my chart here. Um, so if everybody can mute themselves, if they're not speaking, it, it really helps with the feedback and, and everybody being able to hear properly. Thank you. No problem. Um, so the count, the number of cases are up. Deerfield is the designated lead community or the indicator community, and our numbers are up. Um, however, um, we're on top of every case that comes in, and it doesn't appear to be any transmission within our schools. Um, we have not seen the we haven't seen all the cases that will be coming in yet from Thanksgiving, um, I'm sure the numbers are gonna to continue to go up, but we are calling this meeting because, um, you know, there was some question with the numbers going up, but at this point, um, I'm fairly confident there does not appear to be any transmission happening within the schools. And so I wanted to open up the discussion to other boards of health members um, to talk about their feelings on this. I'd like to uh, discuss this. Um, Caitlin Rock, I am the uh, chair of the Sunderland Board of Health. And I think that this is extremely important. Uh, I'm glad we're having this forum. And um, I would like to discuss with the boards of health and uh, with all of the members that all of the people that are invited uh, the basis for my decision making, because I think that that is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think it's very important that the people, and you can tell by the 77 participants <laughs> signed on here today, that the community is very invested and involved. And so I think it's very important that you know that we have been working very diligently together and we want this process to be transparent and it is transparent. It's just very hard when we're not meeting physically, <laughs> you know, to get the, the links out to everybody or to go into private session when we're talking about um, things, uh, cases, and then go public when we're talking about general numbers. Um, so that's why some people may think that we're um, not being transparent or I think someone even thought that we were meeting in secret earlier this week when um, only a few, I think we only just had like the chairs of the Board of Health meeting with uh, Superintendent okay. Modesto and the nurse manager, we were just trying to quickly get some statistics across. So um, first off, just to let you know how I make my decisions, because I can only speak for myself, our boards, we, at least in the Sunderland Board of Health, we all make our decision individually, come together, and then we vote. I go on the baseline assumption, I use data. Okay, and the importance of data is that data gives context for decision making and it helps us analyze relationships between the prevention measures and the outcomes. Data is so important. And we've noticed that because there's been some misuse of data going around the local boards. And when you cherry pick data and you misuse data, there's fear and um, it, it becomes very messy. And when you have a certain outcome in mind 
ahead of time and you pick your data, that also doesn't work. I have a science background. I have some legal background. So I'm a very black and white person. I go out, I look for the data and I see where that leads me. So what I do is I went out and I looked for the data. I work with a baseline assumption. School infection rates are going to at least mirror community infection rates. People in school live in the, and work, live in the community. They come in and out of school, they go home, they go to the supermarket, kids go all over the place. So that's the baseline assumption. What am I looking at to move schools to remote? Are school infection rates higher than the surrounding community? In other words, along with evidence of clusters, which would mean are schools themselves location of virus spread? Now, that's what I'm looking at as a scientific basis. Now, when you look, when I looked at our area, we, we live in a very special area. Uh, so then I moved outward. I looked at all of Massachusetts. I looked at New York State. I went further. I looked at the country and then I went over to Europe, Germany, and South America. What I have found is that schools do not transmit in general at a rate higher than the community. Elementary schools are, transmit less. Now, I brought it back to a local level. When you look in Massachusetts, when we're looking at Massachusetts public schools, I looked at the DESE website and I saw that the approximately 450,000 students are in person in schools based on the most up-to-date sample November 19th through November 25th, 276 students tested positive. That is a 0 0.06 percentage. When you're looking at the state, the state is, hold on. I got it. <laughs> it's over 3% of the community spread. Teachers, the staff, 206 out of 75,000 in-person staff. That's a 0.27. When you look at the state community spread, that's 0.27%. The interesting thing is, is they don't break it down to elementary school and high school. Where you're seeing the spread, and I'll do it, I'll have to say the word anecdotally because they don't break it down. So then I had to then move on to a second level of research. I went to the newspapers. The only place you're really seeing in school spread, and it's not really in school spread, it's actually community spread being brought in school, is high schools. And the reason we're seeing that is for one, they move around more, they socialize more, and you have more of an opportunity to have in school spread if they do, because they change classes and they eat lunch together, which is all mitigating factors that we're doing in our own community. And, but as far as whether we're having in-school spread in Massachusetts, there is not a lot of evidence, evidence of in-school spread. Um, 
where I know that the idea of clusters was brought up in a previous meeting. And that was very concerning. And it was a very concerning word and a very concerning idea. So I did research. I researched the K through 12 clusters. A cluster in Massachusetts is two plus cases from the same source. DESI identified out of 1,842 schools in the month of November, November 1st to November 28th, 30 clusters with 106 attached cases. Now if that's two plus cases, that's 106 total cases. Then they also added ongoing clusters from before November that they couldn't fully close out as 39 cases, 39 clusters with 27 cases. That's 133 total cases. So that is the entire month of November, 133 cases. And if we're looking at 280 something in the last two weeks of cases, we're looking at well below, I mean, that was for the entire month. So to say that the schools are a site of clusters is, is not appropriate. It, it's not even, you're comparing apples and oranges. So, and if you wanted, you want to throw in a little comparison in that same time period, the community clusters was 9,393 in that same time period, producing 25,000 cases. So, I mean, the schools are not a cluster site. Um, they, they put them in there because it's their job to run statistics, the state, and it's there and it is a cluster. A cluster is two or more cases. But I think that when you, statistics are cherry picked in order to get a certain goal or in order to, to lean towards a certain decision, it gets scary. And I don't think that's fair. I think we need to look at the big picture. So I was using those as just examples. I'm just gonna wrap it up because what I did was I looked at Franklin County's case rate. Our case count is 95, okay? That's a positivity rate of 1.45%. Um, our population is 71,000 people and 7,000 people took the test. So that's 1.45% positivity rate. Well, the recommendation is under 5%. I mean, excuse me, is over 5%. That's where you go remote. So we're at 1.45%. We're nowhere near the need to go remote. Sunderland's case count is at 1.5%, nowhere near. Deerfield, 0.7%, nowhere near. So I don't think we're even in the ballpark of going remote. And finally, our infection control measures are amazing. And that is due to the amazingly hard work of our school boards, of our staff, of our teachers, and of the kids and the families, and the women's clubs that have provided masks. And I think what we're doing, you know, there's a lot of places that aren't getting the support and the funding that they need to have these safety measures. And what we're doing is we're really disrespecting all of the safety measures and all of the support we have and we're disrespecting our children by saying oh we can just go remote when we have the masks in place we have the proper hygiene we have the ventilation we have the distancing which we are so lucky to have we have testing of symptomatic kids now we have amazing contact tracing and we have had case, a case in Sunderland Elementary School that all of our infection control measures worked. And the, we went, we used the pod and showed that it did work. So I'm just basing my, the data on whether we should close. 
and well, I said close, go fully remote. And the data right now doesn't show it. Then when I further look at the infection control measures we have in K, in, it just kind of bolsters whether my decision is based upon my mandate as a Board of Health member. And my mandate as a Board of Health member is for the health and safety of the residents of Sunderland. And do I feel that the health and safety of the residents of Sunderland is at risk by leaving the schools open for remote? And I'd say no. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for all that. It's very helpful to- um, thank, Yes, to, thank to, you, Caitlin. I just wanna follow up on Caitlin when she talks about data. It's the numbers, I know we've revised the numbers and that's one of the reasons we are having this meeting are, and it does meet the criteria for emergency because our numbers, you know, this is the first time for most of us being through a true pandemic of any length like this. And so the numbers, we had to have some mix of numbers, but I think you need to drill down on the numbers and what we're seeing in the profile of cases, at least in the, in the, in Deerfield situation is the majority of cases are related to kids in their twenties. You know, it's hard, it's hard to stay home. I understand, but we need to keep urging the kids in the twenties to pay attention. It's the young adults. And then, uh, and, and it's also people in their sixties and seventies. They don't want to go to restaurants, um, you know, but they're tired of not seeing their friends. And so they're having them over for dinner parties. It's a private gatherings that we're seeing the spread. Mm -hmm. And so those, the first question I asked when we go to Trace, is there any connection to our schools? And we're just not seeing the connection to our schools that would have meaningful transmission in the schools. So um, again, I'm just saying what, you need to look at the data and I make my decisions based on data as well. But I also try to drill down and say what's really, really happening in our community. And um, that's one of the reasons we uh, would check constantly as soon as a case comes in, we're on top of it and we follow up on it and, and try to mitigate any kind of transmission happening. Trevor? So I, I agree with all that too. And I, I try to base, you know, all, all of this, we are all learning through this process. There's no easy answer or simple kind of, oh, this is a checklist, this is what we're going to do. Um, but we have learned a lot through this pandemic. And I believe um, I do base a lot of my decisions on uh, most of all my decisions on data and then talking with the people on the ground. Um, Lisa White has been amazing. Meg Birch has been amazing. Uh, Carolyn has just been incredible and Darius through this whole process, um, you know, as it relates to our schools. And um, I, I got a feel for the ground, like what's happening on the ground? Where are the cases coming from? Are we tracing them? Are there cases that we can't connect? They're like, we're getting these you know, clusters and, and we don't know where they're connected and we don't know where they're coming from and we're getting this massive spread. We have seen none of that. We can always zero in pretty quickly on what the case is, where it came from. And you're kind of like, yep, you know, 20 year old went out to a party with a bunch of others or, you know, there was a, a friend came into town. It's kind of that kind of stuff that, that you can kind of figure in pretty quickly as to what's happening. And, and, um, and sure, we, we have had, you know, students in our communities that have had it, but, but, our, but our plans and actions have been really well done and executed by our staff to isolate, trace, you know, make sure these people are safe. And then, you know, when we need to take a pause, you all know that we have, you know, voted and, and requested pauses in school. And then, so part of it's data. And then part of it is also like that intuition or that gut feeling of, okay, uh, we, we have all this data. And so why did we take this, this, you know, we, the data really didn't promote us taking this, this last week off. But our gut intuition felt like, look, there's a lot of people coming into town and we're probably going to see a big jump. Why don't we err on caution and just at least look at these specific tight timelines like this one week to go, OK, let's take this time, make sure we don't have a lot of people coming into town. And, you know, we wind up with a large e expansion of, or, a, or just a giant cluster. And it allowed our teachers to kind of consolidate their classrooms a bit and figure out how they're going to handle the kids coming back. And um, I think it was important to do that. Um, 
did the data say that we needed to? No, we probably could have made it through. But I just feel like whenever we we look at a pro, you know, this process, and and we feel like, you know, the data doesn't show it, but it felt like if we were going to take a smart, a quick break right after a holiday like that, where you know that people are just going to kind of come together, it was a smart move to make, and I think that, and it may help us extend our time to keep our schools open much longer than if we just kind of ignored it. So most of it is based on data. Yes, this this one week, if you if you look back at it, just kind of had a gut intuition of like, let's just be safe for this one week, and then you know keep the kids in uh, remote. And then I feel strongly that we should go back looking at all the data for Franklin County and our region. Yes, it seems to be blowing up everywhere. I've been so thrilled to live in Western Massachusetts. This, this pandemic, we really, we care about public health and we care about making sure that we're safe and we're following the rules as best we can. And uh, we will have cases here and there, but we are, we are addressing them. So my, my, my um, intuition is to is to open back up Monday, but always resolve, uh, reserve the right. If we see something change, if we're unsure about um, something and we see clusters happening, you know, we, we can always emergency uh, take a break as that's in our plan. Let's break for a couple of days, trace it, figure out where it is. Um, if it needs to go longer, we do that. But I just feel like um, we have been running this program really well, and I think we continue that way. So um, I, I would kind of move to go to go back to school on Monday. Again, we've already voted to do that, but we just yeah. need to confirm. Um, yep. Carl, uh, is there anyone in Conway would like to make a comment? Um, not that I know of, unless Bernice got something to say. Veronique, how did did you want to say anything? Fran, um, does Waitley would Waitley like to say anything? Fran, you have to unmute. Um, some of the data and stuff that's mentioned is all well and good. Of course, we all make decisions based on data and talking with the people on the ground. The gift, but. You know, one situation you didn't mention is the positivity rate in Wheatley, which is above 5%. And we did have an incident of this since the last time. But I agree totally that it's not a school transmission problem. And given that uh, right now our, our uh, numbers are very low and the uh, supports that everyone else has talked about um, are in place, I think um, we should just go with the decision made a couple of weeks ago to reopen. And if anything changes radically or even, you know, a big uptake in one of our communities happens, we should decide to uh, go remote again mm -hmm. as needed. It's a good point, Frank, uh, Fran, for, for bringing that positivity rate up. Thank you. I, mm -hmm. I did see that, Fran. And that mm -hmm. you were at 4.4%, but then I also noticed that um, it's five. You, yeah, well, um, okay, but it you only had 92 tests, and that's why. Uh, but yeah, but you, you it's you, if you're going to mention it and use those arguments, you have to use every argument there. So you have Absolutely. to be careful how you um, you know cherry pick. Cherry pick. <laughs> well, and I and that's that's interesting. That's interesting, but that's why that the the dashboard is a very tricky thing to no use kidding. when we're doing the, you know, when you you're talking about the percent positive because it's really based upon a slice and that's why you looking at the community is something that I think is, is, is tends to be much more uh, valuable. It's a given. Thank you. Yeah. So is there any Board of Health um, that feels um, that the decision should be changed? Because um, our vote was already taken. I, Hi, this I, is Veronique. I just want to let you know I was here. I was having trouble with my sound. Sorry. Oh, but I didn't have a comment. <laughs> OK. okay. Um, Veronique, I, I'm sorry. I just do you feel comfortable just going ahead with our previous decision? Yes. OK. Thank you. Thanks. Um, one, before we open up to the public for public comment, I just wanted to say that um, I, I really appreciate all the work that 
um, the school union has done um, to, we're, we are about one of the 150th or so public schools that were approved for the Abbott um, Binax testing. It's an antigen, antigen screening kind of test. And it's good for, it shows that it's good for kids as well as adults. Um, apparently where the paperwork is in, we have to do some training still um, of staff um, and we have to sort out the consent issues with those for under 18. But um, I would anticipate that would probably play into our decision after Christmas break. And, um, and, and I'm hoping it's not gonna be up and running by Christmas time. Um, so with that in mind, I was hoping the four boards of health, um, you know, we're, we're, you don't wanna make a decision too far out because this is, we have to meet again to, you know, reconfirm that this is what we're gonna do. Um, but I was hoping that everyone wouldn't mind meeting together um, on December 29th at five o'clock. Um, we could set up another meeting, a four town board meeting. Um, to talk about uh, reopening on January 4th. Uh, Christmas break is, as Trevor was pointing out, was different than um, Christmas break. Thanksgiving came, kids were ending, uh, and private schools were ending their semesters and they were coming home, the kids part of the family, um, families getting together. Christmas, you have Christmas, um, we, you know, hope we're gonna make it to Christmas and then we have Christmas, and then you have that week, a buffer week already built in. And um, so I'm hoping that if we met the 29th, we could look at what was happening in our communities and make a decision for January 4th. Um, I don't know if anyone feels uncomfortable with that date um, or that it's going to work out for a majority of us to get together. Um, Car Carolyn, this is Veronique again, I'm, and I apologize if you already have mentioned this, but I heard there were like 77 people joining tonight. Is that correct? Like, you know, a large number? We're up to 88 now. 88. 88. Okay. And does that include um, school committees? Um, I, I, it like may so. be. I'm not sure there's a mix of parents and staff and school committees. Okay. All right, I just wanted to make sure because I would like, obviously we're going data driven, which makes all the sense in the world, but just to make sure we have voices from all concerned, um, right. I, I think I, would I help just, us. I just wanted us to get an idea of whether we were going to reconsider, you know, whether there was gonna be more con um, con uh, discussion from the boards of health before we end opened up to anybody to have a discussion. Um, because, and, and I also want to get, hopefully get a commitment of what um, the next step for um, Christmas, uh, after a Christmas um, opening I'm, for I'm, January 4th. Uh, this is Trevor, I'm happy to meet again. I, I really enjoyed um, this group and getting together and talking with all, all four towns and just keeping together as a region. So happy, just happy to meet any time with this group. I, I know it's, um, just one more meeting, but I, I do really appreciate everyone willing to get together and discuss stuff. I think being on the same page is really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, we're so we're gonna. I will post um, have Casey post December 29th at 5 p.m. for um, the four boards of health. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's fine. And that will be discussing the January opening. Um, Obviously, and we can always call a meeting anytime. Um, is there anyone that would like to make a comment before we? Yes, Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne Wells. I teach first grade at the Sunderland Elementary School. I also live in Sunderland, have lived there for 37 years. I love my community, I love my school. I have 14 of the most wonderful first graders that ever walked the earth this year. And I enjoyed having them in for three or four weeks. When we went remote before Thanksgiving, I was thrilled to have them on the screen every day. I have perfect attendance every day with my class. I run my day exactly the same way that I would when they were in the classroom. They're not missing a beat. We're doing all the same activities that we would have done had we been in the classroom. 
Having 14 students in my room is a joy and a pleasure every day. But at this point, I heard that the Polish club has closed because of COVID. I heard that the Deerfield Town Hall has also shut its door because of COVID. We are meeting remotely because of COVID. We have two and a half weeks before the holiday season. I put together the most extensive packets that I possibly can. My parents are wonderful about picking them up. We all played games for math today online. I introduced new topics yesterday in math. I started a new unit on patriotic symbols. We are not missing a beat by not being in the classroom. We are just being safe. One of my colleagues is under, under quarantine because at Thanksgiving, she was exposed to COVID. So if we go back on Monday, I don't think she's gonna be there, but she will have seven or eight students in her room without the teacher teaching remotely. I was all for, ask Ben, ask Darius, I was all for getting my students in every day, all day. But now I'm a little concerned when I see that there's 2,488 people in Massachusetts that contracted the virus and we're on the, the school, the, the numbers are going up every day. I really think that we should, we're playing with fire and if we can err on the safer side and just be remote for the next two and a half weeks, let this calm down, let the vaccine do its work when it comes out. I think that that's the way we should go. And I am all for being in school. 25 years I've worked at that building. I never miss a day. I don't wanna be remote, but I figured it out. And so have all the teachers in this district. We're all awesome at doing remote. And if we have to do it for another two and a half weeks, so be it. We'll do it and we'll make it the best that we can. Thank you for all your work. <coughs> Would anyone else like to make a statement? Jen, do you, Jennifer, do you see anybody? Nope. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Vicki um, Palmer has her hand. Up. Palmer oh, hand yeah, I see, I see Ms. Palmer. Okay. Or, oh, oh. Hello there, everyone. I, I really want to thank Susie for speaking out the way that she did and applaud her for her very smart words. I think what's happening here tonight is that we have well-intended community members, very devoted, caring community members, making decisions while not really ever stepping foot in schools. And I want all of you to understand that while Sunderland, where I work as school psychologist and have for 17 years, is taking very good care with all the work we must do to keep safe, we still are in a place where we have to manage children constantly, reminding them to pull their masks up over their faces, over their noses. Just before we went remote, I had students pull their masks down in my office, sneeze, and then pull their masks back up over their face as directed because they're children. What we are not acknowledging tonight in this meeting is that the testing is really backed up most everywhere. The test results are backed up and the Thanksgiving surge is really still with us. All of us at Sunderland School are working tirelessly to create wonderful remote lessons for children who are coming every day, who look forward to school. We're having great success and we're staying safe this week because it's the smart thing to do. I'm gonna ask this committee to think very carefully about putting others at risk by making these decisions and think very carefully about this choice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Missy Novak who has her hand up. Okay. Missy? All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Good. I was having a little trouble with uh, my audio a little bit ago. Um, I'm just curious whether or not uh, you have a sense of delay in testing results. Right now, what? the test the testing seems to be within an acceptable period of time. Um, we, one of the concerns I've always had is that it, once it goes beyond 
you know, or gets close to 72 hours, it's worthless. So we're, we're really, um, I mean, we're watching it. There's not much you can do about it at this point. Well, I, I guess my, my thought was whether or not uh, there's a concern that maybe people who have just become symptomatic or been exposed after Thanksgiving may be getting a delay in, in their testing results that might warrant uh, a day or two or something like that. Well, like I said, we're just starting. I wouldn't anticipate um, seeing the Thanksgiving numbers for another week or so, to tell you the truth. So um, we're just starting. And um, so we're watching it very carefully. We're watching it very carefully. I understand everyone's concerned, but I have to say that um, even though Deerfield has been approved or is in the process of finishing up the approval for our distribution of the vaccine, I mean, we're really months away. So um, my thought is to, and, and this is, as soon as there's any real transmission um, that would even happen in our schools, then we, we would close, we would take a break. But to say that we're gonna stay remote at this point uh, to, to, before, to let things calm down, it's not gonna calm down. We're just starting the uphill um, climb. So we need to get in and, and do as much as we can at this point and just be, be very vigilant. So I understand your concerns, I really do. Um, but it's a trade off. I'm not with... trying to make an argument one way or the other, just trying yeah. to get more, more information. Thanks, Missy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We have okay. Jessica Corwin. Okay. Corwin. Corwin, hi. Uh, Sunderland School Committee, um, I have a procedural question. The school district's policy says that um, every time the Franklin County numbers are, go above 50 cases in a 14 day period, that it triggers an immediate Board of Health consult. So if you're not meeting again until December 29th, um, you know, these, the numbers have been going up for Franklin County in the last few days. The last few days don't get captured in the weekly dashboard. So I'm just wondering what's going to happen, you know, when- Actually, we consult every day. There isn't a day that doesn't go by that I am not on the phone with Meg or Meg um, uh, Birch or um, Darius, and we are constant con uh, contact. I reach out to the other um, boards of health on a regular basis, two or three times a week. So it's it's um, to say we, again, we were when we lay this out, we need to have we had to have some um, parameters for you know to say that we we're going to create action, but as we mat have matured through the pandemic here, we have decided, um, you know, we're much more hands-on and involved constantly. Um, the first thing I do in the morning when I get up at 6 a.m. is check and see if there are any new cases. Within a couple hours, I check again, and I check again, and I check again. And the first question is, is there any contact with the schools? If, if there is a contact or any association with the schools, I'm immediately on the phone with Meg. Meg is on the phone with me and we're back and forth. And I talk mm -hmm. to other boards of health um, because as you know, it's not in just our four towns. It's um, we have you know a lot of students that come in, um, school choice students. So I reach out to the other boards of health and um, public health nurses in the other communities as well, especially Greenfield and Montague. And uh, we talk on a regular basis. So. To say that we're not immediate consult, we are. We honestly are. Well, the yeah. other the other thing too is that we will, as we did tonight, you, we'll just call another meeting. I mean, we, we've planned a meeting for the 29th, but it doesn't mean we that we wouldn't meet. If we had to meet next week, we'll be right. If there. we have to meet tomorrow, we can. Yeah. The yeah. way yeah. emergency yeah. posting meets is you have to physically post the meeting, but because it's an emergency, you do not you do not have to post the 48 hours. Okay. So um, I, if we need a meeting, I will call everybody up and I'll say, we need to post a meeting and we're gonna have a meeting. And the, other issue, the, um, the other issue I, I think though is, is this was a public meeting and we posted it for the public to be invited. We do have those 
um, what we call emergency meetings with usually just one representative from each board of health and the superintendent, we try to get them, well, I mean, everyone's invited, but whoever can get on the meeting as it's fast our, as possible. It's your emergency management team. It's, a, it's our police, it's our highway. It's, it's everyone that is associated with any um, uh, emergency action in our town. And, you know, we, we did, can discuss it there too. So we, we do, the meetings are not just, um, you know, this is our second meeting this week. So it's, it's not something that happens infrequently. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to, oh, did somebody else want to make a comment? I, I would just like to, uh, Bruce Bennett, Sutherland Board of Health. I'd like to get a comment from the educators about the effectiveness of remote learning and in-person learning and what the difference for the children are in, in those two scenarios. Actually, that's related to what I wanted to say next was just, uh, I've only heard discussion tonight of um, hybrid versus remote learning. There is an in-between option of having only priority students in the building to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our most vulnerable learners in person while reducing risks by having many fewer people in the building. Um, I've spoken with Ben Barshevsky about this um, and I, I know it's being developed across the district. I, I just want that registered in this conversation that it's not just hybrid or remote. Can I get a comment from someone about the effectiveness of the hybrid and the remote? Ms. Marsh? We Hi. have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. Go ahead, I would just, there's three other people with hands up, so just tell me when you want me to get them. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Marsh, and I teach second grade at Sunderland. Um, and I just wanted to speak on the effectiveness of remote learning. Um, I feel like in my classroom, remote learning right now is, I would almost say, more effective than the days that we are in person. And of course, there are students that need to be in person on certain days that need that extra support. But as a whole, I really believe that my class is doing better on the remote days. And that is because we are able to do small group intervention. We are able to meet with kids individually. I am able to have better discussions. In the, in the building right now, my students are spaced six feet apart in desks with our windows wide open. It is cold, the students are freezing. It's, it's honestly not an enjoyable place to be right now. The kids, you know, the kids love it. They love to be with their friends. They love coming to school. But in terms of, you know, really reaching them academically, I truly find that I'm getting more knowledge and learning in on my remote days. You know, just today, um, myself and the other second grade teacher, we had a whole second grade wide writing celebration. We were able to break into small groups. We read our small moment stories. It was awesome. We can't do that in person right now. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot about, you know, waiting until there's in-school transmission. Um, and I'm just wondering why we're waiting until that transmission happens when cases all around us are skyrocketing. And um, it's, it's concerning to me. And I, you know, I really urge you to consider going remote for the couple weeks, at least before the holidays, when districts all around us are going remote. Um, and it just makes the most sense to be the safest we can be before before the break when everyone is traveling, you know, regardless of the protocols. So thank you. Okay, um, next is Diane Kirkendall. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for listening to the teachers right now to get their perspective. That is um, something that means a lot to all of us, I know. Um, I am. I teach second grade in Waitley, um, and Sam is on my second grade um, team. And um, I agree with everything that Sam has just mentioned. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but bear with me if you would. I did have a question for you, Carolyn. Um, I I didn't quite understand what you meant when you said that we're still expecting results from the Thanksgiving carryover. Um, well, my concern, um, I looked at this, I try to look at this from a practical point of view and, you know, and we do make data driven decisions, but I also try to say practical. 
And it was my concern, the reason why we went remote after Thanksgiving, because I looked at this from my own perspective, what would happen in my own household uh, years ago when my kids were uh, school age. And um, if my two older ones were in college, one was in Boston and one was in New York City. And then they would come home and we certainly have a huge house and have plenty of space. They would have quarantined, but by gosh, by Thanksgiving, they would have been having, oh, you're okay. I'm sure they would have joined the table for dinner. I would not have trucked it up to the third floor. But being, um, you know, right, kids, they they haven't seen their friends since, since September. So their best friends would come over and I'm a wicked witch about drinking and driving or any of that stuff. So the kids are up on the third floor so well, their friends would come over and where were the, their friends went to Chicago, school in Chicago, LA, DC and, and North Carolina. So I have just invited in the entire world and then my two younger ones would have gone to school on Monday. So I felt it was really, really important that there was a lot of college kids coming back. There was a lot of you know private school kids coming back and a lot of families get together for Thanksgiving regardless of whether there was a pandemic or not. So it was my opinion that it was, we really needed a week off. But what has happened is, is people did get together and that there are 20 something year olds now at home. Now and most schools aren't going, most colleges aren't going back until um, January. So you have the 20 somethings out meeting with friends and you have the um, follow-up of people getting together. Is that all about the meeting? Can I turn it on here? Uh, I've got a mute, thank you. All right, and, and so what I'm saying is it usually takes, it's, you know, the average transmission time is about seven days, five to seven days, and then, but it can be up to 14. That's why we're, we have not revised our quarantine requirements. And, um, and then people get sick and then they get sick enough to go in the hospitals. And so we will, we will see probably more activity, you know, towards, the, towards Christmas time. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I guess it, it confuses me why we're, we're risking to go into the schools. And um, to answer your question, Bruce, as well, um, I, I have to say the, the momentum and consistency of teaching during our hybrid days, um, I completely agree with Sam. Our days consist so much of washing hands and reminding each other to social distance and to um, remind each other what um, it looks like to wear your mask properly and why we're doing all those things. And please don't get me wrong. And I, I think I can speak for all of the teachers that have voiced their thoughts. Um, we want nothing more than to be in our schools because that is why we teach. That's where joy, a lot of our joy and, um, and, and our socialization comes to play. But we have mastered that remotely right now. And um, like Susie said, I have kids that attend on a regular basis and are excited to, to learn online. Um, we all want to be back in school, but I just, you know, I hope that we're taking into consideration that, like you said, Carolyn, we don't necessarily know the results of what Thanksgiving um, visitation and socialization is bringing. Um, and, it, and it absolutely does cause anxiety for people that are working in the schools. Um, I, I think there's no question that people are, are very stressed and very worried. Um, we just urge everyone in the community to take responsibility, wear your mask, that's the most effective thing they can do, and just encourage compliance, social distancing, and good hygiene. Absolutely, and I, I would like to just piggyback on what Vicki mentioned as well. Um, that, that is absolutely true, but these are young children who are, are learning to do that, and, and I'm not saying, they're doing a great job at it, but um, it does pose for you know. I, I just want to just say from again, this is from my own perspective, is that I feel kids are safer going into the schools. There's no transmission happening or very little transmission happening. Parents have to go to work and you have to understand 
that there are a sacrifice for those families. You know, not every family can stay home. And I just have to say that shuffling kids around, it depends on who's, you know, can somebody watch your kids this day or that day? That's what I'm concerned about as a Board of Health on the alternative. That again, I'm looking, trying to, I'm basing my decisions on data, but I ha also look at this on my, from a perspective, who is watching those kids when they are remote? Is it the grandparents? Is it, is it the neighbors this day and then the next day for somebody else's friends? It, the kids are safer in the schools. And um, I just have to you know, say that this based on what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing and what I see on Facebook. Sorry. Trevor, did you have something you wanted to say before we end the meeting? Uh, no, just, just that, you know, these are a lot of the discussions we have in September, right? You know, everybody's nervous about going back to school. I, I get that. We do have families that, that need to get back to work. That is very difficult on their families to be home, um, you know, teaching four kids or three kids in front of five computers, just trying to get everything straight. Um, we're trying to strike that balance between safety um, and, and the mandate by the state to be in-person learning. I mean, based on what we're seeing from the state requirements, we should be in full-time, all kids, nonstop, no remote, none of that. But we're trying to, we're trying to spark uh, or strike that balance between um, safety and the protocols we think we have for the, for the students and the staff at school and making sure, you know, look, uh, kids learn better in front of a teacher in a classroom with peers. It's not just the instruction you give them, it's the social interaction. Um, there's a, you know, I'm not an educator. Look, I, I don't sit here and pretend that I would know better how to teach a child than, than Suzanne or, or any of the other teachers here today who have mountains more experience. But, but my hat is a little different than that. And I'm looking out for public health and on the school committee, making sure our kids are getting edu educated and, and the best way to educate them is in, in person. I know that we've done a great job and I give the teachers and, and staff an immense amount of credit for being able to come up with the ways to teach them. And I'm sure different days it is better. And I'm, I can't wait until we have a vaccine and we can all get back and shut the windows and crank the heat um, so that you, are, you know, that you are much more comfortable teaching. Um, we are mandated by the state to get the kids back into school. So I know a lot of these, these, this discussion was very similar to September. And we will be, and as we said then, that we will take a break when we think it, it's warranted. And we will keep watching the numbers every day to make sure that, that we're making the right decision and keeping kids and the staff safe. Um, but I do also look out, again, for the families that have to work and the immense amount of stress it is on the, the mom or maybe the single mom that's got two kids or three kids at home trying to make sure that all this education is happening between all of the kids at the same time. They're not teachers, you know, it's fair. I mean, the letters that I get and the conversations that I have from parents, this is extremely stressful for them um, to have their kids at home um, getting taught multiple classes, multiple different age levels, connection problems, it, it, it's difficult. And I know it's difficult on the staff too. It's a horrible position for us to be in. Um, Cause you know, we, but we do care immensely about you and about, yeah. about the, about the, you know, your, te your the teachers, the staff and the children and, and our larger community. It's a tough balance to strike. Um, we don't take it lightly for sure. So thank you. Carolyn, we have one more hand up. Do you want to take that? Yes, why don't we just do that? I feel really bad that if people don't, I don't want to, I, we've been an hour, but I, I hate to shut people off. So one more person. Megan, Tudrin. Hi, um, I just wanted to kind of back up what Carolyn and Trevor are saying that um, I feel like I have a really good picture of this whole scenario. Um, I work in the Deerfield Elementary School as a school nurse. My children attend the school, so I'm also a parent, but I can, take the time off and be with them. So I don't need a daycare provider, but I feel like they definitely do much better in school. There are days that they are barely doing any work at all, like today and yesterday and yesterday because of classroom rearranging. And, you know, they were just doing nothing after 1030 this morning. 
Um, and I feel like there's a lot of days like that. So I, and I'm also a contact tracer for the Greenfield Health Department. Um, so I have a huge handle on all of the cases that are going on. It's very busy, um, but I know where all of these people are getting COVID. Um, I have a family, a huge family, and that counts for 11 of my cases. Um, I feel like if, if I didn't know where the coronavirus was coming from, if I didn't know how it was spreading, I would be worried. But right now, the way things are going, we know where people are getting it from and we know where it was and it wasn't in the schools, that's for sure. Um, it's, it's birthday parties and sleepovers and things like that. And I feel like the kids are definitely safer in the schools even when their parents, had, you know, well, obviously they couldn't go if their parents had it, but you know, it just to distance themselves from other people because in school they're six feet apart, you know, and I just think, sorry, I hate public speaking. Um, my mind is going everywhere, um, <laughs> but I just feel like you're doing the right thing. And I, I feel like I have a good picture and, and I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Megan. Um, like I said, we're, we're trying to keep on it. Megan is, I talked to the Greenfield um, police, I mean, the, the health department up in Greenfield on a regular basis. And I, I mean, I feel like we do have a handle on where it's coming from. So anyway, um, the Deerfield Board of Health will entertain a motion to adjourn, Trevor. To adjourn. All right, I second that. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Um, all the other boards have to please, um, you have to adjourn as well. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Caitlin, go ahead. No problem. Uh, Sunderland Board of Health, um, motion to adjourn. On my board. So moved. Adjourn. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Bruce. Hi. You can. Carl, I think you can go now. <laughs> yep, he did. Okay. Conway Board of Health, motion to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Carl. And Fran? <laughs> muted, Fran. Fran, you have to, I think you have to, you have to, Fran, there you go. You have to make a motion to adjourn. You're muted, Fran. I move that we adjourn. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> oh, so thank you, Becky. Aye. Okay, aye. Oh, that was Becky Jones. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank I really appreciate everybody. I'm sorry. It's very hard to see everyone. And I um, honestly, we were listening. And I apologize if, if we missed anyone. So thank you very much. We planned the next meeting um, as posted as December 29th. Um, however, like I pointed out over and over again, I certainly no one will hesitate to call a meeting if necessary. So thank you very much. Happy thank holidays. You all. Good night. We're going to be going back to school full time.